That was the raw theme. That actually sounds like the raw theme when you do it. Literally, it's what you were just singing. That is nothing. That has didn't sound anything like what I was singing. All right, well, whatever. Well, hey, I'm Cody Guff, and uh, this is Jonathan Martin, and we're amped about a really nerdy slash geeky episode of Game Life Balance US because I went to Minnesota. That's last, where I live. Where you live last weekend, Memorial Day weekend. It was. It was a good weekend for it. It was a, it was a weekend for it. I mean, no, it was a good weekend for it because everybody had a day off work already. Yeah, that's true. Well, that happened. And over a three-day period, a vast expanse of three-day periods, we played so many board games because that's pretty much the idea behind MartinCon, right? Y- yeah. So uh, it's in its original inception, which occurred three years ago. Inception. Martin- MartinCon was developed because... You, there's like five of you that live in Chicago or the Chicago area. And then there's like three of us that don't, right? So there are four of us now. There are four of you now. If you include Madison though, which I would because it's close enough that people can make an easy enough drive just to get down there and and spend a day, you know, like one evening. Like we've got a buddy that's come down to, to come down just for like one party that you guys have been having because it's so close to Madison to Chicago. Yeah. 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 So if you know, it's like, it's like five or six people if you include Madison. So, um, I always kind of feel left out because it's not a short drive for me. It's like in order for me to go down to Chicago, you know, it's a six and a half hour, seven hour drive. I have to like, I I have to commit a chunk of time. I have to commit at least a weekend, typically more than that if I'm going to come down there. So I always feel left out when people are just like coming down for a barbecue or something. All right. If you got off work at five on a Friday, 5.30, let's say, let's say you got to work late and you drove down, you'd get in at 11.30, maybe 12 if you hit traffic. And then we can party till 4.30 in the morning with college students. I don't understand what the problem is with this. I mean, quite frankly, I think that uh, there, I think there's, there's no issue whatsoever with you arriving at midnight, partying till four or five in the morning with college students and me, and then sleeping three hours, getting up, day drinking all afternoon, do partying again until four a.m., maybe with a nap from eight to nine p.m., and then leaving Sunday. What is wrong with that? Well, I go to bed at like nine o'clock now. Like that's, that's like adult bedtime. Oh, so you feel left out, not because we're far away, but because you're getting old. No, I feel left out for both reasons, but you're also getting old. So it's not, it's not just me that is, is feeling the pain of having to deal with like falling asleep early. That's not the point though. The point is, is like when you guys have stuff going on, I always feel left out and it's obviously not your fault. It's just the situation. I live up in Minnesota. So in its original inception, Martin Khan was, hey, because I don't necessarily get to see you guys all that frequently, typically once a year in kind of in the least amount of, of being able to see you, that being in uh, at, at Gen Con every year, why don't I just invite everybody up to see me? So three years ago when we were in our original house, which is smaller than the house I'm in now, uh, we invited like three people or four people up. Um, and everybody came up and we spent the entire weekend playing board games and it was cozy. Um, it, it certainly wasn't as much space as we would have liked to host people, but we did anyway. We played a lot of board games. It was great. There was yeah. enough space. You had a, you had a couple extra bedrooms. P- people had space. I know, but it's still like from a hosting perspective, we didn't like the amount of space we had. Yeah, so, sure. so, um, but it was fine. So we did that. La- we did that two years ago, and then last year we invited more people. I think we invited like five or six, and we still only had about four people, three or four people come, which was fine. Uh, this year we're in the new house, and we said, "Oh, you know, we really hope a lot of people can come because we're in the new house, and we actually have the room to host like everybody." So we invited everybody again, and this time we had six people say yes and come up for the for the weekend. So um, it was awesome because we had room for all six people. We had a ton of fun. And we played a lot of board games like we usually do. And a lot more video games this time, too, because we had kind of so many people here. 
Well, and you have a baby that requires more supervision than he used to. He can take care of himself. He's like almost three. He's like he's like a third of the way through year two, two, three. Oh, we could have all just gone out for a brew, and, and he would have been fine when we came back. Hell, he probably would have wanted to come out with us. To, for a brew. Right, for a brew. Who says a brew? For a pint. He like would have wanted to get a like pint. A, like a root brew? What's a root brew? It's, it's like sarsaparilla. It's what they call sarsaparilla now instead of sarsaparilla. They call it root Mexican, brew. The Mexican hat dance? Like, like A&W root brew or uh, Diet Barks root brew. What, can you get a Diet, Diet Barks root pint? No. Root, that's, or is it a root brew pint? That sounds stupid. No, you don't buy root brew in the pint. It us, root brew usually comes in a can. Can you get a, a pint ca- brew? No, those are the same thing. Can you, does that come in a can then, or? Uh, yes, yes. A brew or a pint can both those can both come in in cans. Yes. You get a canned pint. Of yes. root brew. No, you. Well, yes, yes. Of root brew, you can, and also you can you can get a draft of root brew. It comes as draft as well. But with that, then it's not in a can. No, but it, I'm saying you can get a draft of root brew. Right, but you can't get a canned a pint. pint of a draft root brew. Right, because then it'd be, by definition, it's a draft root brew. Right, but if it's in a can and it's a draft, like what if you poured it into a can, like a tin can? That seems like a lot of work, but I guess you could technically then have a root brew pint in a can. And then I could, put it, I could put it in a mason jar, and then it's a jarred, canned, pint, root brew draft. That was originally a draft, right. Right. Anyway, root brew is great, uh, depending on what kind of root brew you get. Is that what you're drinking right now? No, I'm I'm drinking actual beer, but I'm just I'm saying root brew can be very good. Are you drinking a pint? Is that what you're drinking? I'm not. I'm dr- just literally just a bottle of beer. It's just it's just a bottle. Okay, the standard sixteen ounce bottle. Well, I'm trying to appeal to our sister show, Game Life Balance Australia, for all our Australian listeners, because I know they exist. I know they're out there. There's at least uh-huh. one of them, maybe two. I think, and I mean, they drink root brew. I, I think they drink pints. Of root brew? Well, yeah, because well, right, they, like our British neighbors, are across the pond, mm-hmm. and they, they, they grab pints with their blokes. I think they're, are they blokes? They are blokes. They're definitely blokes. That's a word that works. Okay. Wow. So anyway, uh, we had six, six of, of my friends in our house, along with my baby and my wife, um, and I, it felt very comfortable. Everybody had a lot of space to move around. We ate a lot. A lot. We ate a lot. We ate a uh, lot. We did. We ate a lot. And uh, played a lot of board games, and it was really freaking sweet, and I kind of want to have another Martin Con like, next week. So what are you doing next week? I'm going to be at a wedding. On at Martin Con? On the East Coast. Okay, Delaware. So, oh, that's not Minnesota. So that's not going to work then. Though You're going to have to call the wedding off. Del uh, on the world map behind me, Delaware is relatively close to to Minnesota. It's only a few in- or not, nah, it's several inches. Well, yeah. all right, I don't know what the scale is exactly. Well, uh, yeah, it, your new house is incredible, by the way. So Thank I you. know I told you that, but anyone listening, our listener should be aware that you have an incredible house. And listener, if you'd like to go to MartinCon next year, you're invited. I'm inviting you. I'm fine with that. That's fine. You know, I mean, this is how Gen Con started, right? Wasn't it a bunch of people just hanging out and Gary Gygax just ran some D&D games? Yeah, I believe I believe it originally started. So Gary Gygax got a bunch of people together in Lake uh, Crist- Crystal Lake, maybe? Illinois? Lake Michigan. Hold on. Gen Con. I think it was Crystal Lake. Lake Michigan. Michigan. Michi- Gen- right. Michi- Michigan Gen Con. Um, I, I, think it, I think it was Crystal Lake. It was where? It was actually Lake Geneva. Lake Geneva. Thank you. I knew it was Gen Con, Geneva Con. Right. Right. And then they just like sat and played D and D for like an entire weekend. And then they did that probably I think for a couple of years and then they made it into something bigger when Gary Gygax got famous famous for making D and D. Right. So one of these days when you or I make more new friends, which is unlikely because we're in our thirties. And become famous. 
which is also unlikely because we're us. Right. We can start expanding, make people get hotel rooms. We'll still have it at your house. This is the thing. We're going to increase the attendance numbers and expand to hotels nearby. Sure. But it, but it won't go to a convention center. It will still always be at your house. Okay, I'm comfortable with that. I might have to get a bigger house, though. Nope. Okay. We're probably going to have to outgrow it, though, and move to Indy then. <laughs> I think that defeats the purpose. Okay. Well, that's probably, I mean, I can't think of another way to house all of those people. So, no. uh, yeah, so it was good. It was good. We played a lot of board games and we're going to talk. This episode's going to be kind of talking about the board games that we played. Yeah, this is going to be a bit of a board game review episode. If we haven't lost you already, then uh, now's the time. <laughs> uh, hey, but, but don't, don't go anywhere. Fa- oh, but don't, don't uh, turn, uh, turn that dial. Don't, don't turn, don't turn that dial. <laughs> that's a reference for all the kids all the kids that know what that means turning the dial to change the channel they're not gonna know that anymore they, man we're old yeah so don't don't touch that dial we shouldn't hey. know that like when did we turn dials on tvs to change the channel my great grandma's house <laughs> all right that makes sense she had a tv with literally 12 channels and you that's got a, you turn the dial that's all you need i have less than that now fewer I have less, less fewer channels. <laughs> what I was getting at is we're also going to review X-Men Apocalypse, the movie. Okay. Because every year, because every year at MartinCon, we have to, John has to drag me to a movie against my will that I don't want to see and regret seeing immediately after. Did you not want to see that movie? No, I didn't want to see that movie. <laughs> It's what I thought. So uh, I guess with that, we should, we can talk board games. So I guess we're going to go. Oh. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> that was, it was an aggressive intro to our, to our board game segment. <laughs> hold on. Hold on. Back up. Did you just break something? What Here's what that? I meant to do. I meant to swivel my mic directly in front of my webcam, get real close to my webcam. Cause we do post this on YouTube for right. those of you listening to the podcast. Uh, I wanted to swivel it right up to the webcam, get real close, and, and say the name of the segment. I rearranged our bedroom over the weekend, mm-hmm. half out of boredom, half out of utility. And I have a better desk setup now. The, the angle the viewer will notice is different, so you can see the giant wall size world map behind me instead of okay. just my bed, which I think is nice. Um, and I went to swing the arm, but there is a partition, a wall partition between where my, my microphone arm is mounted and where the screen is. So I just basically slammed the, the, the mic arm into the, the partition. So that, that's what happened. Um, cool story, bro. I can't help but notice that you've got a non-Americentric uh, world map. Like your world map is like too 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 normal scale. It's it's Eurocentric, is what you're saying. Is it Eurocentric? I can't see the whole map. Maybe it's Eurocentric. Well, of course it's Eurocentric. That's what most map world maps are. I just it's listen. We're in the goddamn United States of America here. Listen to what your child screaming bloody murder in the background, which is hilarious to me. USA, USA is all I'm trying to say. That should be front and center. Frankly, that should be the only thing on the wall. It should just be, it should just say world map and then just be a map of the United States. Yeah. Yes, that's what I'm trying to say. USA. USA. First game we played. First game we actually played was a game that you weren't even there for. But first we have to go full gamer. Is it full gamer? Yeah. It's not video games. Okay, doesn't it? It's fine. It's a, it's a, game. a, a game. It's a game. Sure. Okay, it's um, a game. We it's played a game. game. We played a four-player game called Chaos in the Old World, which is one of my personal favorite games. Uh, each player takes on the role of one of the um, of one of the main antagonistic gods in the Warhammer universe, um, and they it's a it's an area control game. So there's a bunch of spots in the map. And you're placing armies across the map, and it's uh, 
it's asymmetrical. So each God has a different set of abilities, a different set of goals, basically. Um, and, but it's very well balanced so that you kind of feel competitive no matter what God uh, you are, you're playing. And it's one of my favorite games because it is asymmetrical like that. Because each time you play the game, provided you're getting a different god each time, feels so incredibly different than the previous play of the game. Um, just because your goals are so much different when you're when you're playing as the different gods. So that was the first game that we played. Um, our our guy that had never played the game before actually won, which in my experience with that game is very difficult to do. Um, just because they're just because you like every every character has different action cards that they can use and they're all different per, per the gods and so if you don't know what the other what the cards do for the other gods if you don't know what could be coming you can't preemptively set up for anything um so it was just it was really interesting but he ended up winning the game um so good for him uh but it was awesome because it's one of my favorite games and it's still really, really fun to play. So I'm mad at you because you played that before I got to Martin Con and I enjoy that game a lot. Uh-huh. I've never won that game. No, it's it's a hard game to win. Which is fine, but it's, it's, it's the kind of game that's fun to play even if you're not winning. Yes. I, we, I played it at Martin Con last year, enjoyed it quite a bit. We probably talked about it on last year's podcast but whatever um the win conditions are the same for everybody correct you just have to score a certain number of points basically but the strategies are different so it's not like everyone has their own objective it's just that getting there you have different abilities now i i've never played risk is this like risk in terms of dominating the world map and I, I mean, uh, very slightly in the sense that there are different areas that you control with your armies. Um, Less so in that, like, you don't just control them by being there. Um, you don't necessarily fight if you coexist in the same area as another player because only certain units roll battle dice and, like, you can exist there after the fight round is over if not everything is dead. So, like, there's only in the sense that you are moving around a map and controlling different zones. But generally, it's it's much, much different than Risk is. Okay. Do you get more points for Green Hill Zone or Emerald City Zone? What I was going to say, though, was you, you said the win conditions are the same. One of the ways you can win the game is to advance your this dial that gives you upgrades um, over the course of the game. Oh, and, right. And while getting to the end of that dial does win the game, um, each person's dial advancement criteria is different. So how each character advances that dial is completely different. And so while they all, while you all need to advance your dial, if you want to take that victory path, um, the way you get there is totally different. So that's why they feel, I mean, that's why they feel so different. Yeah, I was going to say something else. Oh, and there's one other little Easter egg for our longtime listeners. Chaos in the Old World, if I'm correct, is where your son's old nickname came from. That's right. That's actually true. We called him, for a while, we called him Nurgle. Because he, who is the the plague god in the Warhammer universe, uh, because when he very first started going to preschool, Casey and I, Casey, my wife and I, were sick probably two weeks of every month for the first six months that he was in preschool. Because he just spread disease <laughs> and death and decay wherever he walked. So yeah, I mean, he was, he was Nurgle, the plague god. Yeah, so we called him Nurgle. So there you go. But yeah, Chaos in the Old World, I highly recommend. Good game. Yeah. So that was it's, the first... It's, it's one of those games that takes that takes an hour to explain the rules and two to three hours to play, probably. Yeah, I would also say it's one of those games where the very first time you're playing it, about halfway into the game, you're like, wait a minute, I kind of want to start over because now I kind of understand how the interplay between everything is and now I want to like start over now that I think I get it. You know, yeah. So, because we should rank, we should rank these games because there were some games that are more casual that we played. So, for the casual board game listener, that and also length of play. So we. So on a scale of one to Grizzly Bear, this was probably Pumpkin Pie. 
Oh, I was going to say it was Doge. Okay, so this this game was Doge. I, so what are we ranking? Like, what are we rating on? I don't, I don't know. From from beginner to moderate to advanced board game, I would say this is in the advanced category. I agree. I am a couple hours. I would say advanced playtime, a yeah. couple hours. And the fun factor, I would say, is high. Low, medium, high, is I that would really, say high. Is that like scary, happy face with a red with red background? Yeah, it was very good. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So the first night I got there, then we played Avalon. A game that we have an incredible history with. I'm sure we've talked about it on the podcast at some point. You can go to gamelifebalance.us and search Avalon. Uh, and I'm sure you can find it. Just click yeah. on one of the posts on the sidebar. You'll see a search, a search tool. But yeah, Avalon is much like Werewolf, which we have definitely talked about extensively. Mm-hmm on the podcast and I've written about on codygoff.com. You can find a whole long thing about werewolf and Avalon is, is more structured werewolf werewolf essentially, if you're unaware very briefly is a game is social game where you all sit around in a circle. One person is a moderator or a caller. The moderator slash caller kind of, well, narrates the game. Everybody closes their eyes. Werewolves open their eyes and point to somebody who dies they close their eyes again everybody wakes up and then you have to decide who the killer is that's werewolf in a nutshell there's variants and there's other roles that know certain things or can guess certain things that can interact with the moderator in different ways but at the end of the day it's about a bunch of people sitting around a circle more or less blindly wildly accusing each other of being a werewolf or in Avalon's case, a spy or resistance or whatever it might be, and you trying to defend yourself. So it's about bluffing. It's a it's a meta game within a meta game. It's it's very much a board game inception, and it's super fun. People play Werewolf at, at gaming conventions like Gen Con for literally. I, I literally played for eight hours straight the night I discovered Werewolf, and seven hours the following night. It's ridiculous. I think uh, that first year you you didn't sleep those first two nights, right? No. I mean, you came back to the room in the morning and slept. Was yeah, that- no, I came back at 5 a.m. one night, 6 a.m. the next, and I think seven, I think I just all nightered it the, right. the, the, the final night and just slept the way back. So very addictive, especially with friends, but it's fun with strangers too. Avalon's a little bit more structured. The only major difference is that you are, when you're assigned roles, you publicly assign people to go on missions and then the missions either pass or fail depending on if there's a spy on it basically. And you can use logic to determine who the bad guys are. Where Werewolf, there's really, Werewolf is such a metagame that depending on the roles in play, sometimes if you're playing Werewolf, let's say it's seven villagers and one Werewolf, there's no way to really definitively know who the werewolf is other than he's one of the people that hasn't died yet. Whereas in Avalon, if it's me, John and two other people, they send me and John on a mission and we throw two fail cards. They know that we're both bad guys. Uh, That wouldn't happen because John and I are better than that. But uh, just as an example. So that's Avalon in a nutshell. And we played that with several people. Avalon, I bought, for my girlfriend's family for Christmas. And I played with them over Christmas break, actually, uh, when I spent my first Christmas with their place. And her family actually liked it, which is phenomenal and shocking and awesome and amazing. Which is, which is probably one of the important points about this game is that in terms of the difficulty level of this game, this is definitely a beginner yeah. type game. So um, Avalon or Resistance, you know, they're both like 10 bucks. They're just these little boxes, and it's basically just cards. That's all you get. Um, and they are the perfect board games for people that have a very casual interest in designer board games. They're yeah. a great entry point into them. Yeah, extremely accessible. I, yeah, I would, say, I would say low entry level, very high fun level. It's the kind of game that you can sit around drinking and playing, Sometimes drinking makes you worse at the game. Sometimes I think a is. lot of times it makes you worse at the game. Also, <laughs> also, it's a fr- it's definitely a friendship killer. Um, <laughs> one of those types of games because you get done and you're like, I swear to God, I knew you were the spy. You were the spy the whole time. Or somebody screws up and and 
you have to give them hell for that at the end of the game. So there's a lot of fun that is to be had there as well. Yeah. So low point of entry, high fun factor. The length of time can vary wildly. Avalon, not so much. Werewolf, a game with 10 people can last between 25, well, nah, let's say 30 minutes and three hours, depending on how much you overthink it. Avalon, I'd say an hour tops for even the larger groups. Because what's the limit? 10, I think, yeah. for Avalon? Yeah. So you're never going to go more than an hour on Avalon. Maybe a hair over if if you have a very analytical kind of obsessive yeah. group. But yeah, so that's Avalon. And then we played that until wee hours. Well then, and I will say, speaking of getting older, I stayed up the latest every night because I went downstairs and played Smash Brothers. That's very impressive. You, all, again, had a you again had a baby that wakes up at God knows when in the morning, times yeah. I'm not even aware exist. So obviously, yeah, we're dealing with different situations here. But I stayed up and played Smash Brothers for Wii U with our friend Ryan, passed out. And then the next day, you decided that we would play this game. We, we played Last Night on Earth, which is a zombie board game where one player or two players take on the role of the zombies. The rest of the players take on the roles of humans and there are different scenarios. And in like the base scenario, the, hu the humans just have to kill like 14 zombies in the scenario that we were playing. The humans had to find four villagers, which are in this deck of cards that the heroes draw from and then survive till the, till morning. So find four villagers and survive till morning. Um, our, my buddy Will and I were the zombies and we had experience with the game before there were four of you that were not Will and I, and you were not zombies. You were heroes. Um, I, I'm not sure how many of you had experience with the game. I feel like some of you did, right? Not me. Okay. Um, you didn't. I think everybody else did. That's actually not true. I don't know who did, but I think other people had played that game before. So it was us two with experience and then everybody else as, as humans. And um, so that game has the potential to be really fun, but... I learned with this playthrough that it also has the potential to be pretty pretty brutal towards one side or the other. Um, there's quite a bit of luck involved in the game. And you got incredibly unlucky as the heroes at the start of the game. And it pretty much crippled your ability to play the game for the next three quarters of the game. And just at the very end, you started to make any kind of headway at all, but it was far too late. At that point, and the zombies just ended up stomping you. Yeah, I would say this game requires a medium interest in board games and has a low fun factor. <laughs> I did not enjoy this game whatsoever. I would say that the first, because because of the playthrough, it's it's unfortunate because I've had a lot of fun plays of that game. Um, like I said, there was just some unfortunate RNG. That's random number generation, basically randomness that occurred at the start of the game that really crippled the hero's ability to do anything. I would say that the, the fun factor is swingy, if anything. Like, it, it can be really great. Uh, it obviously, and again, that was kind of the first game I've had of that where it's ever done this. It was, it was just, there was, it was pretty brutal. It was pretty so brutal. So this exact situation happened last year with Eldritch Horror, where you say it can be a really fun game, but because of the cards that are drawn and because of the way things kind of pan out and play out, they it's not fun. Didn't we win Eldritch Horror, though? We won Eldritch Horror eventually. Max went to bed before we won. Remember that? Only vaguely. The Eldritch Horror is one of the best games that's out of the market right now. You are wrong. I am, I am in firm belief of that. What is wrong with you? Are you kidding me? I suppose I suppose maybe that that caveat is that is it it you need to play with the expansions as well, which I don't even think were out when we played it the first time. Last year? Yeah, I don't know if the expansions for it were out yet. But the expansions the expansions are awesome for Eldritch right. Horror. Here's, here's the problem with Eldritch Horror and this game is This isn't even a game we played. We didn't even play Eldritch Horror. It this doesn't is, matter. I'm comparing it. Here's the, the, right. Here's the problem with both of these games. There's always a class whose role is to just collect items and give them away. So you essentially, one player of this game, one person who is 
playing, quote unquote, I'm using air quotes, playing a game literally is there to supply equipment to other players so that they can actually play the game. For example, Eldritch Horror, you fight bad guys with shotguns. So I was the item, I was the little item You were whore. the politician. Yeah, I was the politician, I was the little item whore. My job was literally to procure shotguns so that I could give them to someone else to fight monsters. Because You're gonna that's, want a shotgun. Because that's fun for them. And <laughs> it, I was, just, it was fun for everybody else. It was terrible. Everybody no, it, this zombie game was the exact same way. I tried to do a move, and I was like, oh, I want to roll or, or do whatever action, and everybody goes, no, 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 no. You need to get an item, and then you can give it to, to this guy who's in your square. Or you can give this item to Ryan, and then he can use it. Because then he can have fun playing the game while you sit there, and your turn is literally draw a card and hand it to Ryan. That's the problem of both of these games. I, I dislike Eldritch Horror, and I dislike Last Night on Earth. I'm sorry. I just I don't like games where one role is specifically help other players have fun while you ostensibly do nothing. Now, to be fair, you have only played each of those games once. So I think I would say that from my experience with board games, both of them, Eldritch Horror far more than Last Night on Earth, but both of them deserve an, another honest chance from you. They really do. All right. Well, maybe. I'm I'm still I'm saying for a first time gamer. I got I, I got a I got a firm maybe. That's all I need. All right. Uh, so we played last night on Earth. It was great. Uh, that's what we just said. For and you then, and Will. And then we and then we played uh, Rule for the Galaxy, which actually I didn't play this. I didn't play this once this weekend. Uh, that weekend, and you guys I think played it two or three times. Yeah, we played it. A, I played it twice. Uh, so there's a game called Race for the Galaxy. I intensely dislike that game. I played it once when I was in Madison with our friends Max and Will. I didn't care for role, for Race for the Galaxy in any way. I don't even remember anything about the game other than I disliked it. This is Roll for the Galaxy, which is the version where you roll dice instead of play cards. Basically, they replaced... The very first time I played Race for the Galaxy, I found it for some reason, and I'm relatively savvy with board games, but for some reason I found it really complicated. Yeah. And that was my biggest problem with Race for the Galaxy the very first time I played it. After I got it, after I played it a couple times, I really liked it a lot. But for some reason, it just seemed unnecessarily complicated to me when I first played it. Yeah, and same here. That's why I probably didn't like it. And, I, and I'm, I'm probably I'm not as big of a board gamer as you, but I certainly understand strategy, and I understand how to do these things. Yeah. But yeah, so Roll for the Galaxy, I liked a lot better. I, didn't, I did not dislike Roll for the Galaxy. I wasn't good at it. But you essentially roll dice to build parts of a space colony you're, you're colonizing. And once someone has built 12 locations, you kind of win the game. My only problem with this game is that there's, from what I could tell, more or less, there's not really any way to mess up another player. So part of the strategy of board games, and, and this this will play into Citadels, which we'll talk about later. Part of what's fun about board games, really well-crafted board games, is that if one player is really far ahead, then rather than spend your entire turn getting yourself more points, you can dedicate some of your turn to reducing the winner's points, which then pulls you closer to victory by ostensibly blocking someone else's victory. My problem with the role for the galaxy was there wasn't much if any, opportunity to block other players' progress. So there were, for example, there were two or three turns away from, I'm looking at Will's pieces and I'm like, well, Will is going to win. Clearly, he is ahead. And there was right. nothing I could do about it. And that, I thought, took away from it a little bit. I would still, though, say moderate difficulty and I would still say moderate fun. I, it's, it's probably a good game for people that don't like that competitive aspect that maybe just want to kind of silo their operations and work that way. And it's also kind of nice because you effectively take your turns at the same time, which does save a ton of time when playing board games. That's why seven wonders is probably my favorite advanced level board game um, because you all take your turns simultaneously and when playing with people that take several hours for a turn, sometimes, uh, not hours, but a long time, that's, that's a really good thing. So, so Roll for the Galaxy, I'd, I'd say, was a, a pretty averagely good game. Uh, again, moderate interest or moderate uh, difficulty, moderate um, a fun factor, and really only an hour and a half or two to play at the, at the most. Mm -hmm. Probably faster if you're faster with the game. 
and you get to roll buckets of dice. And who doesn't love to roll buckets yeah, of dice? You get to roll. There's a lot of dice. Colored there's, dice. There were a lot of dice. Rainbow colored dice. So many a dice. A lot of dice. All over the place. So I didn't play that one. Uh, while you guys were playing Roll for the Galaxy, I was teaching. I didn't actually play this game. I was teaching a game called Sheriff of Nottingham, which is a, we'll call this a beginner type game. So it's a great intro level game. There's basically no board at all. It's a barter game. And the shtick behind the game is one person assumes the role of the Sheriff of Nottingham and it goes around to each player. Each player assumes that role twice. And there are, everybody else is, assumes the role of a merchant that is trying to bring goods to market. And there are legal goods that they can bring to market. But then there's also illegal goods. And the shtick is that they've, they've each got a bag and they put the cards in the bag that they're going to be bringing to market. And then they hand it to the Sheriff of Nottingham. And the Sheriff looks at the bag and he says... All right, I really think I want to open this because I think you've got, you know, I've got you've got contraband in here. What do you give me not to open it? And then the the player goes, "Oh, I'll give you, you know, five coins," or "Oh, I'll give you a chicken from my market." That's basically the the idea behind the game. There's there's a ton of interplay there of what you can do to bribe the sheriff. Whether the sheriff's just going to be a dick anyway and open the bag. Um, super great though as a bartering game, uh, and and I I specifically picked it as a game that I wanted played at martin con because my wife's not a huge board gamer but this was totally the type of game that i thought she could play and would really enjoy and i was right she totally did she loved it um and so did my my other friends who are moderate moderate board game aficionados so it was really cool i would highly encourage anybody anybody that um is only has a slight a slight interest in board games to try it because it's it's excellent it really is who was the sheriff the sheriff changes each turn oh oh that's okay that's cool yeah that's very cool yeah it, it, so you would say low difficulty high fun level very low difficulty high fun level it's it's also fast um w people took you know three or four turns to get the hang of it but then they moved it much faster after that so hour hour and a half or so yeah and there's a great meta component in that you know, if I played it with my wife, she would literally open my bag every time, no matter <laughs> what, because she would think she would think I was trying to sneak by like contraband for her. Um, and like my buddy Nick and his wife, Kristen, played and she whenever Nick was the sheriff twice, obviously, she literally like lied completely because he has no idea when she does. <laughs> she he has absolutely no idea. So she complete. She got like four contraband goods to market on one turn or something like that. I mean, it was ridiculous. So it was pretty. It was good. It was and it's funny and it's just it's good. It's a great game. Good, awesome. Yeah, it seemed like a lot of fun from the yeah. next room. Yeah, while I was just rolling dice in a cup. <sighs> That's a drinking game too, for sure. It's definitely the type of game you drink when you play. Drinking games are good. Yep. You didn't make Bloody Marys last weekend. No. We didn't. Gotta get, I, got, I will buy you Bloody Mary stuff next weekend. You make a killer Bloody Mary. Bloody Marys are awesome. So then that night, we played a game called Citadels, which I remember literally nothing about <laughs> because I was very drunk. So Citadels is a, Citadels is a city building game where, where each turn, the player assumes one of eight roles that have these like special powers and you gather money and you gather a hand of cards of buildings, basically. And then you use that money to build the buildings. And then each of the roles that you pick at the start of the turn um, may benefit from certain building types that you build throughout the game. Um, so it's a lot of, it's a game that's, a, it's a lot of, it's a lot of reaction to what you draw, what is available to you. Uh, because it's a draft in terms of what role you get, all eight roles are put out at the beginning of every turn, and then it goes around in a circle based on the first player as to who's going to get to choose first. So it's 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 you reacting to what role is available and what cards am I drawing that I can build in front of me, and how am I going to do that? Um, it's it's I think it's deceptively deep, I would say, in terms of its uh, its like strategy. Because there's a lot of synergy between the cards as well as the rolls on the table. Um, I don't think we were in the state of mind that evening to 
kind of develop that complex strategy, but the game is deeper than it looks, I would say. Um, it's also easy. So it's a very easy game to learn. Um, and so that makes it also a great entry level game for people to play. Yeah. And speaking uh, to refer back to earlier when I talked about sabotaging other people, I was about to win. I was about to play, make a play, and I was going to win by a pretty decent margin. And Nick took his turn right before me. And his entire turn, he played a card that destroyed two of my buildings or something. And it completely set me back. And it made the game go two full rounds of people around the circle longer. And I will say I did end up winning by like one point. But that's because I was looking at you and one of our friends, maybe Will or Ryan, you and one of our friends were really close to clinching victory. And I saw that and I did something that I, I feel like I I've destroyed one of my buildings. I think I happened. did. And then I think I played off someone else's move because they didn't do, they did a thing that inadvertently benefited me by what card they took because you, you would pick a new role of these eight or nine roles each turn. Right. Kind of pass around and pick a new role. So I, I ended up playing off of what other people were playing. They, you know, and again, strategy, if they'd been paying more attention, they would have known, Oh, if Cody picks role number eight, he's probably going to win. Well, no one picked role number eight. So I grab role number eight and I'm like, all right, I got this. So that's how I ended up winning by a couple points. So I would say, I would say low to moderate entry level and very high fun factor. It I is. It's really super fun. It. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it really is a super fun game. And it was fast. It was less than an hour. I thought. Yeah. They go pretty, they, it goes, six, yeah, it goes, it goes very fast. That game how many of us were there? Six or seven? I think there was six. No, there might've been seven. Yeah. Six. No, it was six. It was six. Okay. But still a good... No, it was Nick, Kristen, you, Casey, me, Ryan. I thought John was playing or Will or somebody. John I, there was were seven playing. at least. If, if John was playing that game, you two would have had mutually assured destruction and neither of you would have won. <laughs> That's probably true. Because that is a great segue to the next game that, that we played. The final game. Really the final game that we played, which was Battlestar Galactica. Dude, I don't know, so man. You you actually played this game. I taught it and kind of helped support people playing it because it it is a long game and I had to be free to do other stuff. Literally eight hours. It was eight hours. And there were six of us. Which is common. I mean, I think I think the majority of the time I play with very experienced players and five people takes about five hours. So Battlestar Galactica is an extremely complicated board game. Yes. I would put the difficulty level higher than any game we've mentioned, including Chaos in the Old World. Yes, it's, it is. It, especially when you're playing with two expansions or two and a half or one and a half or whatever we were playing with. So it, we had six, six players, right? I think there were six of us. Uh, there were six of you. Yeah, six of us, right? So... It's a fun game. You're, you're, if you're not familiar with Battlestar Galactica, the TV show, basically there's humans. They built Cylons, which is a robot. Many years ago, Cylons flew away into space, came back decades, centuries later, or whatever, killed all the humans except for a small group of survivors. And then the humans have to escape to Earth. the promised land, get away from the Cylons and, and hide on, this whole, on their new home planet. And, and so Cylons are bad guys. However, the twist in the series is that Cylons look like humans. So some Cylons look like humans. So this Don't even, game, not even just look like humans. I mean, they are humans. They are humans. If you, if you cut them open, they, they are humans on the inside. Like they are humans. Yeah. So the idea of this game is you're all humans and you are trying to escape Cylon fleets and jump to this promised land. The twist is that at the beginning of the game, you're dealt roll cards. And your role will probably be human, but you may be a Cylon. And these are kept secret. So there's automatically intrigue, kind of like in Werewolf or Avalon. Then halfway into the game, after your ship has jumped a few times, you deal out more roll cards. And 
of the deck, there's 12 cards. There, I think, yeah, there's 12 cards. There were six of us. I mean, and, it depends on the number of, of people. Uh, yeah, however many people. But, but essentially, there's a very high chance that two of you will become Cylons or that two Cylon cards will be dealt out. Maybe I was a Cylon at the beginning of the game, and then halfway through, when they deal out the next roll cards, I get the second Cylon card. And there's a point in the game where I can actually reveal myself as a Cylon, hand my other card to someone, no matter what it is, human, Cylon, whatever, and then they become a Cylon. Or they don't, because I was just giving them a human card. So there is a level of intrigue. There's a level of who's the bad guy, is there a bad guy, is there a spy? And that's, that, that theoretically is really fun and really good. Um, I... I it's, I don't know, man. I don't know how I feel about this game. It, in, it should be a really fun game, but it ends up not always being that. And I think maybe part of it is because it's so complicated that you always end up with some people that take forever on their turn. You just, you always do. It's automatic. And so in this particular game, I w- there were actually no Cylons the first round. I was dealt a Cylon card the second round. And my friend John, not you, John, but other John, Russian John, actually. Russian John and I were each dealt Cylon cards. I didn't know that. No, and you would have no way of knowing. Yeah, we, could, we didn't know each other were Cylons. I, so I made a play in the game that revealed my Cylon card. And everybody's like, oh, why'd you reveal your Cylon card? You shouldn't have done that. Everybody knows. Ha ha, a terrible play. And I go... Well, because I have two Cylon cards and I have to reveal myself so I can give one to somebody so I have an ally in this game. Sound logic, sound strategy, right? Because I didn't have another Cylon card. I had a human card. My strategy was, oh, if I give it to this person, everybody will think they're a Cylon. Right. They'll throw them in the brig. Then they're down a player. This is a good play. Right. And, and your pure hatred for John Simon forced you to give that other card to John Simon. Yeah, yeah. Not my, knowing, not knowing that he was in fact already your Cylon partner. Yeah, so that was terrible. So it was the worst luck. It was just awful, awful luck. And then there was really nothing I could do to prevent the humans from from doing whatever. I, I think there's an element in in a lot of these very complicated board games to where if one player is very seasoned and very experienced, that player ends up kind of telling everyone what to do and kind of playing as the entire good guy team. That can definitely happen. I think that often happens, especially when we're playing games with, with, with Max, um, who knows it's, these games really well, and he's, he's fun to play with, but it's unavoidable, right? Like, if I'm experienced and I know the rules and I know how to win, I, I'm going to advise my teammates on how to win. It makes sense. But Max is so knowledgeable of the rules and so familiar with these games that it then almost becomes him versus the adversity, or him and Will maybe... And then it, I think that's the problem. I think the there's game definitely, there's, the game definitely lends itself to, it's called, it, I think they call it power gamer, um, is like the colloquial term for that in the board gaming community of, of games that lend themselves to a player taking over the, the board, basically. Um, and this is definitely a game that lends itself to that because the humans are all on a team. So it is, it is the kind of game where, if somebody is doing that, either they need to be made aware that they're doing that or they themselves just need to be cognizant that maybe they have the potential to do that. Because one of my buddies down in Chicago is very much a power gamer. In fact, the, the guy who we always play with, Dave, is very very much wants to kind of take control of games. And he's very good about not doing that uh, in this game particularly, but in other games as well, because he knows he kind of lends himself to that. And, and I didn't even realize really that Max does that until literally this conversation. So, and it, it's, not, it's not a shot on it against him, obviously. He's good at these games. And he knows how to play. And anybody playing a game is going to want to be like, oh, hey, here's how we win again. But, um, but I think because of the disparity in experience levels bet- between he and, and Will and the rest of us, you know, the rest, uh, three of the players hadn't played before at all. And I had played once and only had a vague... <coughs> excuse me, only had a vague concept of the rules. So I think that that really complicates things. I, I think if it had just been us newbies or 
And, and it would have been different maybe if he had been the Cylon. It might have been more fun if the power gamer was the Cylon because then they're not as advising as much or they're misadvising and then you have to kind of work your way through it. But um, I, There's, I think- there was also, and, and I would have liked you to only play with one expansion. Playing with two expansions did complicate things a little more, especially for the people that hadn't played before. Part of the game, the fact that you guys played with two expansions, you could just kind of had to deal with that. Yeah, I mean, the game is complicated enough right. on its own, let alone with expansions. Right. So that is, that is my review. I would say I would see excruciatingly uh, high experience level, and I would say moderate to high fun, but it so much depends on the group you're with that it, it's kind of hard to say. And the thing is, without a quote-unquote power gamer that really knows the rules inside it out, you can't play. <laughs> Because no one knows what's going on. Like, I cannot imagine sitting down with this game and its 30-page instruction booklet and four friends who have never played before and being like, okay, let's work our way through this. It's just, you know, it's really hard. So it's a tricky yeah, I game. I think the game, the game has quite a bit of elegance when it comes to game design. Definitely the most of all of the games that we played this weekend in terms of elegant game design. Um, it has, like, part of the mechanic is that at the end of every turn, somebody draws a crisis and everybody gets to interact with the crisis. So you're never just sitting around waiting for turns. There's, you are always interacting with the game in some way. If you are sitting around and waiting for turns, it's because people don't really know what they're doing all that well. Once you can experience group in that game, um, it it really moves and you're always doing something even if it's not your turn speed would have been helpful because i do remember complaining specifically about from the time we sat down and explained the rules to the time i took my first turn it was over an hour yeah and that's not that is actually not unusual for more complicated board games at all um but there, there are quite a few games that i have played that i do play uh that require that kind of commitment to learning rules and explaining rules. Yeah. And it's a fantasy flight game, which is, that's, I mean, that's very top shelf board game designer, right? That's pretty much the gold standard for game board game design in many people's minds. They certainly have the most chits in all of their games. Ch- chips. Yes. So many, so many pieces. I th- oh, so many I th- pieces. I'm sure that they are, that they are many people's favorite publisher of board games that are into the board game scene. Yeah. So you know, again, I don't mean to knock it. It's just, it's tricky. I think it's tricky to do right. I think it requires more than just the game itself. It requires the right group of people, the right circumstances. Uh, and if it, if it falls into place, I, I think it, I, I think would like it to play it. I would like to play it at Gen Con since I didn't get a chance to play it with you guys at Martin Con. See, and so I, I would, but it's eight hours. It took us eight hours to play. Yeah. But what else are we doing at Gen Con? We're there to play board games. Yeah, that's true. I'd rather play Chaos in the Old World and other stuff, though. I mean, we, there's literally time to do both. That's true. Well, I, I know that I put the video game you've been playing on our list, but uh, I am running out of time to podcast. I'm good. Along. So we need to expedite to one more quick hit before we close, and that is X-Men Apocalypse. I mean, I don't have much to say other than I was incredibly disappointed. It was, I, awful. it was awful. It was pretty terrible. It was awful. Yeah, was it, it worse was. than X-Men 3? I think it was on the same level as X-Men 3. They took, they took what should have been an incredible villain, and he was awful. He was completely ineffectual as a villain. And yet not Doctor Doom awful, because Doctor Doom is supposed to be a really powerful villain. But in the movies, his powers are meh. This apocalypse has ridiculous powers. He basically points at you and you melt. I mean, he like, he, like, he, like, was able to make Magneto, like, turn a city upside down. Like. Yeah, he was powerful. But yes. But didn't. Do anything. <laughs> right. He didn't do anything. I thought the first hour of the film was excruciating. It was, it was sketches. It was yeah. It was and and they, it was it was the same introductions of characters that we've seen over and over again for like five to ten minutes. Yeah, you you can literally see the first ten seconds of the scene and know exactly what's going to happen. Yeah, 
oh, Nightcrawler is there and he's in a fight. I wonder if he'll teleport a whole bunch. And I wonder if he'll run away and escape. Hey, that happened. Oh, look, Cyclops is discovering that he shoots lasers out of his eyes. There's a bully at school. I wonder if he'll shoot a laser at the bully at school. And, and, and they all end abruptly. And then it's like, it's like someone wrote 10 sketches, comedy, five-minute comedy sketches that aren't funny or, or interesting or unpredictable. And then mash the, and then just put them one by one, inter, inter uh, interspersed with dramatic camera shots of apocalypse and all the villains posing dramatically. Yes, there was so much posing. A lot of posing. So avoid this movie. Save yourself the money. Thank God it was six dollars in Minnesota. Holy crap! Yeah, it was not good. It was not I haven't good. paid six dollars for a movie in like a decade. So yeah, don't go see it. Don't even, don't even rent it. Don't even rent it. Don't even talk about it. Don't even look at me. Don't even look me in the eye. Don't look at it. Yeah. So anyway, uh, well, to wrap up, I'd like to mention that we are on the Gunna Geek Network, which is a network uh-huh. of geeky podcasts and content and other things you hear us talk about in every episode. I am sure that other shows on the Gunna Geek Network are talking X-Men Apocalypse. Um, I don't see any from a quick scan of our promo sheet, but... Again, I am sure that it's there. Just go to gunnageek.com and you can search for that stuff. Now, this week on Nerd Alert News, episode 38, those sneaky ads. Uh, Nerd Alert News is talk about the Deadpool movie, which continues to break new ground. Early impressions of the Suicide Squad movie seem fairly positive, which is nice. And Marvel Studios may have uh, just found their Captain Marvel. Tease. It's me. Yeah, it is. The featured story is that smart TV makers are finding new ways to insert ads into your TV watching experience. How prevalent is it and what can be done to fix it? Chris will address this week. That sounds dumb and annoying. Not the podcast, but ads and smart TVs. And this week on Tyrion's Landing, uh, episode 104, Blood of My Blood, this week Jeannie and Nikki are Rachel Free and it shows. They discuss the repercussions after the events from... I don't know what that word is, but after the events from the last episode, there was a lot of setup for the last half of the season and Jeannie and Nikki speculate on what it all means. And I'm excited to catch up. I am now on season three with my girlfriend. So my, my wife and I tried to watch Jessica Jones. Oh yeah. Got about five episodes in. I didn't love it. Yeah. Yeah. We really didn't. So we were stopping. I think we both kind of found her character kind of annoying. She's I, a bit more abrasive than I think she needs to be. I get he, that she's the kind but, of... But it's, it's, it's just like, like her reaction to stuff is so... It's, it's just so... I don't know. Like, it's, there's, there's no complexity at all to her character. In both of our opinions. Yeah. Like the way she reacts is like so rote to that type of, of like tortured female character that it just wasn't interesting to us. Yeah. I I think my problem with Jessica Jones was that the, the premise of the villain in the entire first season is, is effectively that he raped her, right? That it's, it's an abuse relationship. Yes. And I think that that's an extremely complicated and difficult subject to tackle. And I think that there's a way to do it really, really well. And I think that there's a way to not do it as well. I don't think the season, I watched all of season one. I, I think that there are moments when it's done extremely well, but I, I overall, don't I think that if we're breaking bad quality writing, it would be a really eye-opening show that teaches a lot of people a lot about abusive relationships and their implications and very serious culturally relevant subjects. But, but I think it's it, not. It, it tries to be short. it tries to be sarcastic and quippy and funny and it Yeah, I just didn't it just doesn't do it. Just doesn't do it for us. I don't mind sarcastic and quippy and funny, but they the way that she interacts with him, it doesn't, as someone who is more familiar than I'd like to be with the psychology of abusive kind of relationships like that, it it doesn't, 
it doesn't strike a chord. I think that it needs to. So I, I enjoyed it overall. I actually enjoyed season one um, quite a lot. I enjoyed it more than I like Daredevil season one. And, and I think it's a good show. And I think David Tennant's good. I still enjoyed it, but, but I can see where you're coming from. It, it is not groundbreaking television and it, it doesn't, my only pro- main problem was that it didn't live up to the potential of here's this big issue right here in front of you that you could really just, you know, take the ball and run with it. And I was, I was more hoping that it was a superhero. It was a superhero show that was not going to be written like a superhero show. And I was disappointed because it was still written like a superhero show. I think that was, what do you mean? Like a superhero show in the, in like the way that the humor is presented in the way, you know, like I, in the, in like the, just the way the dialogue is, it was a Marvel, it was like a Marvel show. Like you, you know, Marvel movies, right? Like, you know, Marvel movies and shows, they are, they're all, they're like all relatively the same. To me, it's why, it's why like I, I'm burned out on them. (laughs) <laughs> it's because they are they are all they all are like effectively the same in terms of like story structure but mostly it's like the dialogue like there's a lot of there's a lot of sarcastic quippiness in every single marvel movie and show it's very Joss Whedon. Yeah, I agree. Um, but you yeah. should still see the Avengers because it was, aw- or Captain America Civil War because it was awesome. No, and I'm sure it is, and I and I want to, but I'm 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 getting fatigued. I'm getting fatigued by that writing, and this show kind of was promised to be kind of a more darker take on stuff, and it ended up not being that. And like you said, for a subject matter that, like, it's like a subject matter that maybe should be taken more seriously. Yeah. And and that's interesting you say that because Daredevil is a very, I think Dare, I've been told by many members of the Gun and Geek Network, we've ta- we've had conversations and they say Jessica Jones gets really dark, goes to dark places. I thought Daredevil was darker overall. Just because the villain in Jessica Jones, who is played by David Tennant and has his, kind of flippant British attitude, just because he does some really awful things doesn't make it dark. It's the way in which you do something. When you're flippant about it and he's essentially got the mind of an infant, he he doesn't register guilt. He doesn't register uh, not having power over everything. No, he's a sociopath. He's a sociopath. When you have a sociopath, that's different than the Kingpin in Daredevil, who is an exceptional villain, who knows exactly what he's doing. And he's very calculated and he feels that the sacrifices he makes, the lives he takes are worth what he's building towards. So I thought, I thought the opposite of what everybody else thinks, but I, that's pretty much me and the Geek Network in a nutshell. And that was, and that was my disappointment with Jessica Jones was that like, I was, I was pumped to start it because of all of the great things I'd heard about it. And they just fell flat for me. Yeah. Well, check out a couple episodes of Daredevil. Maybe you'll like it. Sounds good to me. I will uh, just finish up then by saying thank you, everybody, for listening to the Game Life Balance US podcast, the American edition of the Game Life Balance podcast. Please like, share, and subscribe if you enjoyed this episode and leave us a review if you really want to make our day. You can find us on the Gunna Geek Network at gunnageek.com or on the official podcast network of Chicago's WGN Radio at wgnplus.com. Learn more about Game Life Balance, including contact information and links to our sister show in Australia at gamelifebalance.us. And remember, we're bi-weekly now. Game Life Balance Australia is also bi-weekly. So you can now listen to both Game Life Balance editions globally and have a podcast to listen to every week. There are new episodes out. It is hilarious as always. I enjoy them. I have dreams about them. I am watching you in your sleep. If you're watch, if you're watching me, then you're well, if you're watching Rob, then you're watching me. That's weird. Podcastception. Do 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 do.